I was preparing for John 17, I got the feeling something's missing. You know, there is something, there's something fundamental that you kind of need to understand. In order to understand Jesus' high priestly prayer, it's important to understand his mission. Because in the high priestly prayer, what happens is Jesus, the Son, prays to the Father. And he does it on purpose. He, he, lets, everybody, he lets us hear it. I mean, he prays aloud. Jesus couldn't pray in privately. But instead of praying privately, he prays out loud so everybody can hear his relationship with the Father and what he's going to say. And so it's done for our benefit. That's why Jesus prays out loud. And what he discusses is the mission. Father and Son got together. Before Jesus came to earth, Father and Son got together and colluded to come up with this plan to save man. Now, it wasn't just... It's a, and so, you know, what I got to thinking about was, okay, he didn't save everybody. If you take a look throughout the Gospels, there are two kinds of people that God sees. The righteous and the workers of iniquity. There's not a whole lot of gray area here. And the question becomes, because Jesus talks about this mission to save the righteous, and so I got to thinking, what exactly distinguishes them? It can't, it's not magic words. It's not somebody who prays a prayer and voila, you cross the finish line. There's something about that. And it's the same thing in 1 John. <clears throat> in 1 John, you know, John you know, lets us know that you know, once, you're, once you're in Jesus' hand, he's never letting you go. That's over there in the Gospel of John. But then he talks about if you don't love your brother, you're not going to make it. And it sounds like, so what's going on? What is it? What, does, what are the character traits of the righteous that make them have confidence that they are going to heaven? What are the character traits that God is looking for? So, when he looks at somebody, remember the parable of the sower, where the sower is walking along and he's throwing seeds all over the place. And the seeds that landed on good soil sprung up and produced a crop. Well, what, are the, what, is the, what does the soil represent? Our hearts. The soil represents the hearts of people. Some people's hearts are very shallow. Some people's hearts are very crowded with the cares of this world. And some people's hearts are ready and they will respond. They will respond. And so the question that God is asking of individuals is, will you let me make you righteous? Will you let me make you righteous? If the answer is yes, at some point in your life, it doesn't have to be right now, right this very minute, but if at some point in your life, you, the answer is yes, then you make it and you grow and right, you come to him. The father gives you to the son, you accept salvation and you grow into that righteous individual if the answer is yes, okay? And it's important to understand that. And with that understanding, 1 John and uh, John 17 make a lot more sense. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The Gospels are essentially the story of the rescue of the good-hearted people of the earth. As I mentioned, the Lord sees humanity as being of two different kinds. Good-hearted and bad-hearted. All right? And again, what is it about the good-hearted people that he likes? Because if you take a look, I mean, if you were to quantify um, goodness and badness, there are several ways you could do this, all right? Uh, how many good deeds did you perform during your life? How many good deeds? How many temptations did you avoid? Okay? And how many acts of sincere worship did you perform? All right? So if you take a look at those and you were to just have like a, an angel sitting on your shoulder, tallying up how many good deeds, how many temptations avoided, and how, much, how many uh, sincere acts of worship that you did, what you would probably find is that the good people, the good-hearted people, have a certain level of good deeds, and the bad-hearted people have less. But compared to God's perfect standard, neither one stacks up. And so even all the good works of the good-hearted people still don't come close to God's perfect standard. And yet, Psalm 34, 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and ears open to prayer. This is before Jesus came. 
Now, we understand as Christians that when God, when the Lord comes into our hearts, he transforms us and he makes us more righteous. So how in the world can in the Old Testament, how can David say thousands of years, you know, hundreds of years before Jesus shows up, the, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Where are these righteous people coming from? What righteous people? Doesn't Isaiah say there is none righteous? No, not one. So clearly, and that's kind of what I'm getting here, is that when God looks at us, he looks at the whole picture and he asks the question, at some point in your life, will you let me make you righteous? Because we're not there yet. Nobody is there yet. If you were to take a snapshot, everybody falls short. So when we look at a life, when we look at a person, we look at one time in history. We'll take a look at this girl's life. Here she is as a baby. There she is as an old 75-year-old woman. I used to think that was much older than it was. <laughs> the older I get, less, the, the less old 75 is. <laughs> anyway, if we look at her, let's say, you know, right now in 2019, she's 12 years old, and so we sum her up. Is she a believer or not? Is she righteous or not? Well, she prayed that prayer to ask Jesus into her heart a year ago. So, yeah, I guess she's saved, right? We look at where she is right now. How many good deeds, how many temptations avoided, how sincere does her acts of worship become? Now, if we were to come by, you know, uh, half a lifetime later, can you be certain she's still going to believe that way? She's still going to be walking? Can you be certain of that? Have you ever seen anybody who sincerely seemed to have transformation they seem to be a solid christian and a decade or so later you come back and you go what happened to you what's he gonna say james well the detail and everything there is the word seemed yeah <laughs> okay yeah 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 the word seemed the word seemed there's a, a very troublesome passage in scripture it says that where jesus said he who endures to the end shall be saved all right it's not a snapshot we we judge by snapshots because we are stuck in this body and this body is confined by time. We are right here, right now. This is our spot and we observe life from this vantage point and we are limited. We see a person right now. That's not how God sees, sees us though. Questions, will you let me make you righteous? Not just for this minute but for the whole thing. And so God looks at the whole life and asks the question, okay, yes, you might have been cool here, but what about here, 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 and here? All right. Will you let me make you righteous? God wants to save the righteous. So the question is, who you call a righteous? Who are the righteous? What are the character traits of the people that God considers righteous? There are 10 of them. And that's what we're going to cover today, the 10 attributes of the people God calls righteous. That's it. Okay. We're not even going to make it into John, 1 John or John 17. We're just going to talk about this because it, it's, it's, it's an important, you know, I hate to do this because I promise to keep up, but this is such an important topic. And if you understand this, 1 John makes more sense. All right. And that's why I really do want to cover this. All right, so what are the 10 traits of the righteous? And I'm just going to say another thing, too. Um, as you know, I, that near-death studies is kind of one of my hobbies. Uh, I've read over 1,000 cases. I've, I've interviewed over 100 people who have had near-death experiences. And one thing that I've noticed over the years of looking into this subject is something I haven't seen anybody write down, but I have noticed a pattern. And that is, when people die and they go into the tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel there's this brilliant light, and the source of this light is always the Lord. It always is. It's always God. So when people get closer and closer, they feel really good. Now some people are able to see Him clearly when they get in there, and other people cannot. They, they, they basically, they have to, he has to, he has to come, from, come at them from behind because they can't take the light. It seems that the more sincere your heart, the closer you are in your heart to the truth, to accepting God, to growing in Him, the more likely you are to see His face. Whereas if you're kind of far away, if He's an arm's length away or farther, you don't really get to see the face. All right, it just seems that seems to be a pattern here, okay? That the more, the closer you are to Him, the, the more obedient you are, the, the more the more detail you can see in the face of God. All right, so that's just the side, just the, that picture reminded me of that, so that's why I threw that out there. Now, Psalm 33, 18, we just saw that verse that says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, 
and his ears are open to, her, open to their prayer. Now here's a passage, uh, Psalm 33, 8, that narrows down a little bit of what he's talking about. It says here, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. And so you go, oh, okay, so he's looking at the righteous, and guess what the light righteous have? A couple of attributes. So we need to start a list. What are the attributes of the righteous? So the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, whose hope is in his unfailing love. Now, what does it mean? What does the life of somebody who fears God, what does that look like compared to somebody that doesn't? Does that mean that we tremble at the idea of God, and as soon as somebody starts talking about God, we run away? Not exactly. Fearing God means our attitude and behavior are such that we live like we're being watched by an all-powerful God that will pay us back. What I mean is when I, you know, you're, 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 as I mentioned many times, you are composed of four beings. Your consciousness has four inputs that make up what you call you. You have your lizard brain. That's your basic instincts as an animal. You have your emotional brain, which is your limbic brain or your rat brain. Okay, and that's the part that feels emotion. Crocodiles don't have emotion. Dogs, mice, and cats, they do. People, monkeys, we all have emotions. That's your limbic brain. Now, the lizard brain and the, and the animal brain, they, they have two goals. I want to feel good and avoid pain. All right? They're very, they gravitate towards pleasure and they gravitate away from pain. Okay? Now, on top of your animal, your rat brain, your emotional brain, you've got your consciousness, you've got your logical brain, you've got your rational brain, and that's your prefrontal cortex and so forth. All right? And that's where you're, you, you are able to think about your future. You know, I know you've got to go right now, but why don't you wait to go to the bathroom? You know, doing it right here in the hall is not a good idea. Okay? That's, that could lead to consequences. So you ignore your lizard brain and your rat brain, and you follow your rational brain because your rational brain thinks about your future. Your rational brain thinks that's illogical, that's wrong, so let's not do that. And then you have your soul, which is over all of it. Now, if we're perfect, we listen to our souls, assuming our souls are following God, okay? And we ignore the, the lizard and the rat, and we, we opt for, the, for what, what's good for our eternal soul and everything, all right? So we, we make these decisions. Now, the thing is, is that when we are faced with a temptation, fearing God means we think, okay, I could do this, but there's going to be a consequence. God said, don't do this. And if I do this thing that God said don't do, he's not going to be idle on it. There, I'm risking consequences, maybe right now, and then certainly in the hereafter. And so that's what it means to fear God, to be aware that you're not alone. I had a patient many years ago who was one of my first near-death patients. Her name was Helen. And when she described meeting God and watching that movie of her life, one of the things that really impressed her, one of the things she said to me, when I actually recorded the whole session, she said, as I was watching the movie of my life, I was amazed at myself. And I said, what do you mean by that? I was amazed because I knew on some level that God was watching me. He was with me the whole time. I knew it and I totally ignored it. But I know, because as I was watching the movie, I said, I remember, I knew it, but I cast it aside. I chose to ignore that. And that's one thing that impressed her is that, wow, I think we all have that. We're all kind of aware that we're not alone. Okay, but we rationalize it, we toss it aside. I don't see anybody, so I can get away with it. Okay, because God is there, behaviors have consequences. So, now on the other hand, so that's what it means to fear God, to be aware that He's there and to alter your behavior accordingly. Okay, now what does it mean to, for somebody who hopes in God's unfailing love? What does that look like compared to somebody who doesn't? Hoping in God's unfailing love means you live like you believe that God is good and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. It matters if I do the right thing, if I make sacrifices and I'm kind to people who can't pay me back, all right? If I, if I, if I donate money, even though I don't have control over it once it leaves my hands, when I do those good things, does it matter? Does it matter? And so it's, it's important, it was saying, what, what, what the verse is saying here is, yes, it's important that you fear God and that when you plan on doing bad things that you consider 
God, God sees this and there's going to be consequences. But also, when you do good, it's not for nothing. When you do good, it's not for nothing. Why? Because God is there. He's keeping a record and it matters. So the awareness that God is present and watching and all that you do matters, those are criteria for being righteous. And it is possible to completely, even though that, that it's niggling there, it's in our, it's in our hearts, it's, the, it's there, everybody has that awareness, it is possible to divert our attention elsewhere so that we don't feel it. The opposite, God may or may not be real, whatever the case, we have no way of knowing what he's like, he doesn't actually care what I do, and he punish evil and doesn't answer prayer and intervene in any way. Uh, bottom line is, is I don't believe that God can do anything. There, there may or may not be a God, and if he does exist, he's not doing anything. Look at, all the, look at all the bad things that happen in the world. If God were real, we would be living in an utopia. That is like the stupidest logic. Assuming, I mean, just think about that. It's like, okay, so your version of God doesn't exist. Therefore, no version of God can exist. That's what you're saying. I mean, let's be honest here. That's what you're saying. If the utopian God that I want to be real, if that doesn't exist, who gives everybody what they want and prevents all bad things, but I want the God who makes heaven right now the way I want it. And if it's not, if he, if there's, if he, if he puts us through any suffering at all, then he can't be God. Because God, a good God, would run things the way I want. It is the most ridiculous logic that you can imagine when you, when you, when you realize, when they, you know, this is what they're saying though. And I, I hear this all, all the time, okay? It's like, this is such a stupid idea. Psalm 33, 18. Um, so according to that passage, the criteria for being considered one of the righteous is uh, we need to believe that God punishes evil behavior and he rewards good behavior. And then we have Isaiah 57, 15. For this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I live for this. God's saying, I live for this. You know, I love it when people are contrite and humble and, and when they're contrite, when they're brought down and depressed by their sins and when it affects them, I want to lift them up. But I need them to have that first experience first. There needs to be legitimate shame. Okay, this is the New Living Translation verse. And the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, the holy one says this, I live in that high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I refresh the humble and give new courage to those with repentant hearts. The word contrite means expressing remorse or penitence, affected by guilt, affected by guilt. Guilt is a bad word. Shame is a bad word in this culture. If you're feeling guilt and shame, that's bad. You shouldn't feel guilty about anything. You shouldn't feel ashamed about anything because you're a good person. And we all know in order for you to be psychologically well-balanced, you have to be not guilty. You have to be without shame, okay, because that's healthy. And where that came from, um, I mean, this is, again, this is nonsense. But people don't, when their children misbehave, when they steal and lie and, and are violent and abusive, uh, they don't want to say you're a bad boy. Don't want to say, don't call them a bad boy or a bad girl because you'll, you'll affect their psych psych psychiatrically, you'll damage them. Well, it's important to understand our imperfections. It's important to understand when we do wrong. And there is such a thing as legitimate shame. Legitimate shame is like a pain. It's like pain. Pain is a gift. Do you know anybody who didn't, wasn't able to feel pain? I have. I've treated somebody who had some of the congenital absence of pain. Ged was terrified because he couldn't feel pain. As a result, he is at risk for losing limbs because when you get wounded, you need to pull your hand away from the offending agent and attend to yourself. Pain tells you, stop doing what you're doing and get attention. All right? And he had some problems because he couldn't feel pain. Now, as a dis he was hard to discipline, I'll tell you that right now, because spankings don't hurt when you, <laughs> okay? And so I was treating him for severe behavioral disturbances, all right? But he had a lot of anxiety because he could not feel pain. Pain protects you. Same thing with psychological pain. Shame lets you know that you crossed a line and you need to do a 180.
that's what shame does for you and you need to pay attention to it yeah. so non-contrite using defense mechanisms to justify my sin and feel better about myself as soon as somebody makes me feel guilty I use a defense mechanism I rationalize it but I have an excuse or I project it you know you he, he who smelt it dealt it okay you know you might you know that's that it must have been you you know you're accusing me you must be guilty of it all right and so you use a defense mechanism so that you don't have to take responsibility for what you did. And that way you don't feel ashamed. That's what it means to not be contrite. To be contrite means to accept legitimate shame for my sinful act and put forth effort not to do it again. I don't want to repeat it. Ouch. I didn't like feeling guilty. I don't like feeling shame. So I need to maybe not lie next time. Maybe I ought to not, you know, uh, verbally abuse somebody that offends me. Maybe I need to pay attention and, 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 and be different. Uh, and I also need to be willing to make amends for my trespass, right? If I stole something, maybe I need to pay that back. Or if I verbally abuse somebody, perhaps I should apologize. Because when I am willing to make amends and apologize, that suggests that I'm really, truly contrite. I truly accept full responsibility because if I did it, I'm responsible, responsible to try to undo it, okay? Me, if it's all on me, then I need to try to do it. That's what it means to be contrite, to accept legitimate shame. Now, there is illegitimate shame, too. I'm not going to say that all shame is, is bad, okay? All shame is good because I have had, I've had people that have really, their, their shame receptors are, on, are too sensitive. They came from families where they were such perfectionists. Now, if you put your fork on the wrong side of the plate, it results in a meltdown. Your parents get all upset and want to hit you over some stupid stuff like that. And so children who grow up in that kind of environment where the parents were, were, were too critical, they end up with so much shame, they try to turn shame off altogether because they had overload and that's their parents' fault. So we talked about fear of God, we talked about believing that God is good and he rewards good behavior, and then we just added three is we need people that are characteristically truly sorry for their sins contrite. God is looking for people that are humble and contrite. Psalm 66 2, my hands have made both heaven and earth and they are mine. I the Lord have spoken. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts. So basically we're reinforcing what we just saw. God really needs to see that very big, very big factor. Who tremble at my word. Whoa, okay, that's a new thing. Who tremble at my word. What does it mean to tremble at God's word? What does that mean? Well, what it doesn't mean is that we avoid reading it. Okay, uh, that's not what it means. Uh, it means, it's, it's tremble here is about respect. If you were in front of a T-Rex, you would probably tremble with great respect. <laughs> okay, um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't taunt it. Same thing with a bull elephant. You wouldn't taunt it because you don't want to get smushed. You realize you're at its mercy. Okay, now respecting the fact that the creator of the universe has communicated his values in human language, that's first of all, it's, it's, you have to be able to grasp that. Did God, did God present his values for, it, verbally? You know, I mean, is, 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 this, is this really God's word? Okay, do we believe that? On some level, we kind of need to do that. We kind of need to believe that God really cared enough about us to leave us in language that we can understand a record of his values. That's important, okay? And we need to respect that word as from him, even though we may not obey it all the time. So it doesn't mean we have to be perfect, but do we at least acknowledge that, yeah, yeah, God said this. So in, the, in, in terms of our overall respect, what God says has to have more weight and more influence than my wisdom, my feelings, and popular opinions. We see today a lot of mainline denominations are putting the world's values ahead of God's values. Uh, we've seen that, I mean, I, I never, I didn't imagine in my lifetime I would see this, but it's happening a lot. Mainline, one of the reasons why Ward is Ward Evangelical Presbyterian Church instead of just Ward Presbyterian Church is that when the Presbyterian Church decided that the Bible eh, may, or may or may not be God's word, when that's not our final say, okay, you're leaving what it means to be Christian.
Okay, that's fundamentally part of being Christian is to accept, okay, is this, is, did God say this? Okay, so that's a big deal. So what is more important, popular opinion, wisdom, my feelings, or what God says? This is the opposite of that, obviously. All right, another thing. So this is, we added another one here, number four. We acknowledge that God has spoken his values to man and that we are willing to esteem and respect God's values over our own feelings and opinions and over the beliefs of other humans. Okay, what is more important? I mean, wow. And as, as we go forward into the future, what we're going to, we see that what the world is doing is saying that wrong is right and right is wrong. Morality is being literally turned upside down so that the people who are immoral are those that, who insist that there's only one way to God. Those that are immoral are those who insist on biblical values, on talking about them and living them. And uh, so, I mean, never before has there been such a huge difference. If you were to become a Christian in ancient Greece around the time of Paul, um, a lot of the values of Aristotle and Plato were that, not that far away from Christian values, okay? And so they could recognize, now we live in a time that's like pre-Aristotle. I mean, we're going back to paganism before rational moral thought. Micah 6, 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So here in Micah, we have one of these prophets saying, you know what, all these sacrifices that, that we do in the Mosaic law, it does, that's not what he wants. That's not what he wants. That's not, what, that's not what's important. What's important is these three things, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So we're going to break those three down and add to our list of ten. All right, so the Ampl Amplified Bible says, He has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly and to love kindness and mercy and to humble yourself and walk humbly with your God. Now, what does it mean to act justly or do justice? This was the hard one. I mean, I've heard this verse for years and years. And I think Greenman, in his class, that was where I first came across this verse because he talked about that quite a bit. And um, the question is, what does it mean to act justly? And there, there are four components to acting justly or doing right. Uh, one, and it, stands, it spells the word male, by the way. Male, like, you know, you have male. Okay, uh, M-A-I-L. Okay, so M, morally righteous. Uh, the Bible provides the moral standard. We accept the Bible as the moral standard. It defines right and wrong. The words and actions of a person of integrity align with God's truth. He or she does what is right, even when nobody is watching. Okay, so the, being morally righteous is not just about in front of people. There are a lot of Christians a lot of Christians who do the right things in public, they say all the right words, but their hearts are kind of dark. Those people do exist. They're very religious. I mean, they go to a solid Christian church. They say the right things, but in private, you can't see the difference. In private, the way they talk to people in private, what they do in private, what they do in their hearts, it, it just doesn't show. And so being more, doing justice or acting justly involves being morally righteous even when nobody's looking. A, accurate. How truthful. Lying is a form of manipulation. We lie to make sure people do what we want. We lie to make sure, sure people believe like we want. And so we exaggerate and, tell, and don't tell the truth. Uh, part of doing justice is, is accurately uh, not deceiving people, not deceiving people. Impartial. Well, this is a hard one right here, being impartial, because we judge. Part of intelligence is being prejudiced. Okay? I mean, coming up, you know, part of, part of look, if you're in an urban setting and you see a gang of people coming at you, all right, and they're dressed rather shabbily and they look kind of menacing, 
and they're coming up to, to you, I mean, chances are you want to turn and walk the other way because you assume something bad could happen. Now, if you see a group of, you know, a group, a group of Mormons coming at you, you're likely to not be afraid, <laughs> okay, or, or a group of, or a choir or something like that. And so your brain looks at the situation and you sum up the situation and you come to a conclusion, even though you don't know those people. Okay, it could, be, it could be a Bible study and that could just be how they dress. You know, you don't know that, but you take precautions based on your experience. Well, that can work against us because we judge people. Somebody comes into my office and the, the marijuana smell is reeking off of them and they have, on top of that, there's significant body odor. Um, you tend to go, there, right away, you, you draw some conclusions. Now, those conclusions may or may not be fair. The thing is, is that one thing that I have to always praise is, Lord, let me treat this person the way you want me to. You know, help me to see them through your eyes. I have to do that all the time. I don't think there's ever a week that goes by that I don't have to say that prayer because my lower brain is summing things up and it judges people. Okay, I can't turn that off. I can't turn that off, but I'm responsible for what I do. And if I say something condescending or if I treat somebody badly because of my prejudice, then I'm responsible for that. As a Christian, as a Christian God tells me that every person who's alive could potentially get saved. Every person who's alive, God loved the world and he gave his life for that person. So, I don't know, I don't, it doesn't matter how their education is, how their hygiene is, how th their practices, you know what? There's still hope for them and they're, they, they're, they are owed a modicum of respect. Okay, and so being impartial is part of being a Christian. We are not to show favoritism to the beautiful, to the smart, to the successful. We are to treat people as they are, with the dignity afforded them, because they are all potentially children of God, okay? And then lawful. God established the governing authorities, and if the laws are not in violation of God, of his laws, then we need to follow them. We don't use excuses as to, to for ways to, uh, to break the law. So this is what it is to act justly or do justice. Morally righteous, even when nobody's looking, accurate and truthful, impartial, and lawful. All right, any questions on those guys? All right. All right. Fought number five, we strive to treat people impartially. Number six, truthful with no exaggeration. Seven, law abiding and then moral, even when nobody's looking. All right. So we're up to number eight. So we've got two more to go. Going back to that previous verse, no, O people, the Lord has already told you what is good. And this is what he requires, uh, requires to do what is right. That is to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Okay, so but to do justice, which we discuss now, what does it mean to love mercy? What does it mean to love mercy? Well, we all love to receive mercy. That's easy. Yeah. I mean, uh, everybody likes to escape negative consequences for their bad behavior. You know, I mean, well, you were going 65 and a 35, all right? Um, I'm going to give you a warning this time. That's mercy, <laughs> okay? We all love that. We're all like, whoa, boy, man, thank you. Thank you, officer, okay? We love that. We love getting mercy, okay? Averting punishment feels good, but that's not what, what God means when he means mercy. Mercy doesn't mean letting injustice prevail. All right, uh, in 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God didn't wink at our sin. He says, well, because I like you so much, I'm going to let you off. All those sins you did really didn't matter that much. You know, I mean, hey, it's cool. I like you, so come on over. No, I mean, those sins had to be punished. There had to be a payment for them. And he chose to make Jesus that payment for us. It cost God a lot. God's mercy cost Jesus his life. He took the penalty and the punishment that we deserved. Now, the thing is, if we receive mercy, we must give mercy. This is a very big deal. Um, you know, this is so important to understand because there are, if you, if, if you, the more clearly you understand this, the more John and 1 John make sense because we have talk suggesting that Christian, there are some Christians that might not make it. And this is the reason that most of them are going to fall short because they don't give mercy. 
They want to receive it, but they don't really give it. Okay, mercy will cost us comfort and time. It'll cost us money and status, and it will give us heartache sometimes. All right, facing insults without retaliating, forgiving for the upteenth time, graciously bearing the consequences of someone else's sin, reaching out to the lonely, neglected, or addicted without expecting anything in return, holding your tongue and returning kindness to those that offend you. This is what mercy looks like. That's what it means to give mercy from us. So it's not, you know, yes, mercy. I love mercy. I love Jesus dying for my sins, so I don't have to worry about anything ever again. I says, okay, no, 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 no. You have to give it. If you take it from me, I expect you to give it to others. As a follower of Jesus, you know, again, this is just says the, the, the command to, to, to give mercy. It's like, you know, well, well, yeah, I'd love to receive it. But when it comes to giving it, we tend to be a little bit miser, miserly. We want to make people pay for their sins. We want to teach them, hey, you violated the Bible. I can quote you chapter and verse. You did something wrong right here. You need to learn that. So I need to teach you just how bad you are. You did what you did was selfish. What you did was insensitive. What you did was wrong. Okay. And as a Christian, I'm pointing out, I'm going to embarrass you in front of everybody. And I'm going to verbally put you down to make sure you pay for that. And that way you'll grow up and be a good Christian. Okay. And the question is, whenever we're about to do something like that, the question is, would I want somebody to teach me like this? Would I want somebody to teach me and put me in my place like this? How would I want to learn about my wrong? Okay. Is this the way, is this what I would want? All right. Mark 11:25. 25, Jesus said this. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Okay. Now, it only applies to men, okay? Notice it doesn't say you have to forgive women, just, just men. Okay? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Now, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. So before you're praying, now, what does that mean? Because, see, this is kind of confusing because you go, does that mean it's okay? You know, I had a wife cheat on me occasionally, <laughs> okay? you know? And it's like, you know, hey, you know, so, like, do I have to say that's okay? No, you don't have to say it's okay. You don't. You don't have to like what they did. You don't have to like them, but you demonstrate love by praying for them. He says, Lord, you know, yes, I still, you know, I'm, I'm upset, but, you know, I give it to you and I pray that good can come out of this. And I pray for the good for that person. I pray for their salvation. That's all you got to do. You bless them. And then when you're around them, you give to them, you're supportive. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't um, abuse them in any way, okay? But that's what we have to do. So in, in order for God, this is scary because it says that he can't. It's like he can't. And I'm going to go into that. Why is it? Why is this so necessary? Because as a Christian, you've got this, I forgive you all your sins. And then you got this, well, if you don't forgive others, it doesn't count. <laughs> okay. See there, see, see the problem? See, see the deal here? I forgive you all your sins, but if you don't forgive others, eh, you don't get it. All right, never forget the parable of the unforgiving servant. Never, ever. This is a really important parable. For number one, it is told by God. This is a story told to us by God himself. So that's one of the reasons why you absolutely cannot forget this. Okay, so what, just briefly, let's go over the parable. All right, Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, Jesus replied, 70 times seven. For this reason, Jesus goes on, for this reason, what does he mean for this reason? For this, he says, for this issue, this issue of when people bug you, when people offend you, okay, because that's going to happen, let me tell you a story. So that's what Jesus is saying here. Because this is going to crop up, I guarantee you, as you go through life, people are going to step on your toes and offend you. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes not on purpose. But you will be offended. Get ready for it. It's going to happen. So when it happens, keep this story in mind. And he said, The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. If he's a nice king to loan to his servants. <laughs> hey, king, can I borrow a couple hundred bucks? Sure. You want to have a million? Eh, okay, just pay me back when you get time. <laughs> you, know, you know, great king. Okay, anyway, all right, so he decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors 
was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So the king ordered that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. But the man fell down before the king and begged him, Oh, sir, be patient with me and I will pay it. Then the king was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. So this guy borrowed. I mean, he borrowed all this money. What did he do with it? How did he use up millions of dollars? Okay, he borrowed it and he can't pay it back. So the king was legitimately saying, dude, you know, I borrowed it. I, you know, you're supposed to pay it back. He has every right to, to do that. Anyway, but when the man who had been forgiven all this stuff, when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time. Be patient and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and jailed until the debt could be paid in full. Because back in those days, you worked in jail, okay? I mean, you, had, you worked to pay off what you owed. You had to pay, you, you, you know, that's how you, your, your money went to pay for your offense. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him what had happened. Then the king called in the man who had forgiven, who he had forgiven and said, you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just, just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid every penny. And then Jesus said, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters in your heart. Right? That's, that's a threat from God. That is a threat from God. All right? It needs to be taken seriously every day of our lives. Every time we're offended, we need to remember that God is threatening us with this person. What were you going to say? He didn't, need, he didn't just say, okay, you, you have longer to pay. God, uh, the king, completely wiped out. Yeah, completely debt. wiped out his entire debt. The guy had no way. He had absolutely no way of paying that back. None. And the Lord and, and, and the king realized that, that he was in a hopeless state. He says, you know what? You know what? Fine. Fine. Just it's OK. It's OK. I forgive the whole thing. All right. I use this example here to say, why is that so offensive? Why does God refuse to forgive us if we do that? Well, I'm going to look at this. Imagine this. We have a kid here who's just really tired. It's, it's winter all the time and he hates going to the bus stop to get the bus to go to school. It's cold. And he, he, he makes this prayer. He, he, he asked this of his father. He says, for my birthday, I want an Uber account with prepaid unlimited mileage so I don't have to walk to the bus stop in the winter. I said, I just, I just don't want to be cold anymore. Could I just have unlimited Uber so they come pick me up and take me to school and I never have to walk in the snow ever again? That's all I want. And his father says, your behavior does not please me. You have not earned my favor. Okay, so it's like, man, you don't, you don't deserve that. I have heard your plea, however, and I want you to know that you don't deserve an Uber account or anything, but because I love you, boom, he buys the kid a Lexus, all right? He says, all right, dude, you know, you got, you got a Lexus, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, he says, all you have to do in order to take possession of this Lexus, all you have to do is let me teach you to drive after, I t after you let me teach you drive, is give some other kids from school rides to school on occasion. That's it. I'm giving you a Lexus. I'm going to teach you to drive. And all I ask in return is just use this car to give rides to other kids at school. So little Jimmy goes, I would be happy to give rides to people that please me and earn my favor. I'd be happy to do that. Yes, that sounds great. Show off my new car. Actually, I want you to give rise to people that displease you and haven't earned your favor. Just like you didn't earn this car, I'm giving it to you, car free. And so I expect you to show the same mercy and generosity I've given you. I want you to pay it forward, pass it around. That's all I'm asking is, hey, recognize what I've done for you and do likewise to others. Okay, just like I let you off the hook and gave you what you didn't deserve, you need to let others off the hook and give them what they deserve. And so he goes, oh wait, you didn't earn this car. I gave it to you due to my grace. Give rides to kids that have offended you and have not earned, earned your favor or no deal, okay? 
And so what does the kid do? Thanks anyway. <laughs> All right. No, no, I'd rather, if I, if I have to do that, no. And see, that's what it is. When we don't give grace to others, when we don't forgive others, what we're doing is saying, oh, God, you know, you didn't really forgive that much. I mean, you know, you're, you know, this, I, you know, failure to forgive indicates that we don't appreciate the gift that God has given us in the carte blanche forgiveness of our sins. We don't really appreciate it. You didn't forgive that much. It wasn't that big a deal. I choose Christianity as my religion because I want to make sure I don't go to hell for some stupid sin that I might commit. I like the guarantee. And there's a lot of Christians like that, that yeah, they, they accept Christ and yeah, he died for my sins. But how do you perceive your sins exactly? Was that a big deal? Did you have a lot of sins? See, the thing is, is that when we take a look at the sin severity and sin frequency, this is, this is me and this is everybody else. In terms of the, um, this is the severity, this is the sin frequency. And so my severity and frequency are low compared to everybody else. They have big time. And so when Jesus died on the cross, what, that, that, that's fine. And it does pay for sins, but it's like this. For people that sin five and a half or lower, well, they earned that salvation. Jesus died for them because they're righteous, because they don't end up on the news. Okay, so they're at five and a half. But people that score more than that, they don't deserve Christ's forgiveness. They're not worthy of that. They're extra bad. I don't have to forgive those people because, you know, I received grace, but look how good I am. All right. See, that's what when we choose not to forgive people, it suggests that this is of the perception of our sin. And the Lord is saying, if this is what you think, you don't get the benefit of salvation because you have not repented, you minimize your sin, you minimize what I did on the cross, and therefore, if, you can't, if you're not gonna pay it forward, as I've asked you, then no deal, no deal. Anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly, resentment, okay, we, we are not allowed to do that. It's not, no, it, not non-negotiable, non-negotiable. We have nine here, you know, a willingness to forgive, very, very important. And number 10 is what does it mean to walk humbly with God? Now, well, basically, it's understanding that uh, everything we have comes from Him. We are stewards. We are not special. We are not extra good. Uh, and it's kind of along those lines of impartiality, but it's that recognizing that we don't have special status. We understand His authority to lead me and to surrender to Him. We understand that He made all people in His image and we value and respect each person. And that we're also stewards. Everything that we have is His. And that's a part of walking humbly with God, is understanding that all that we have is truly His. When it goes away, do we swear at Him? When we lose things, when we lose money, do we get mad and start swearing and shaking our fists and getting angry? It's His. It's all his. I am a servant. All that I have is his. All that I ever will have is his. My future is his. My past, it's all his. And so whether it comes or goes, he'll take care of it. He'll take care of me adequately no matter what. And walking humbly with God is being aware of that. So that completes our list of 10 things. All right. The criteria for being, because this, this is what he's looking for. It doesn't mean we have to have all of these traits right now. But this is what he's d developing in us, and these are the things that he approves of, okay? So hopefully that will, as we get into 1 John, um, things make more sense, because he, he has some harsh words to say for Christians who are unloving. But if you understand this principle, and this kind of gives you the mechanism, because so, so, people think, oh, wait a minute, that means you lose your salvation. No, it means that you probably didn't have your salvation because you didn't appropriately re repent. Okay, that's not, that's not true repentance. If you don't, if you minimize your sin and you say other people's sins are so great and yours aren't that bad, it, you don't really appreciate what he gave you. If you don't appreciate it, you don't get the keys to the Lexus. Okay? All right. Yeah? Well, you know, when it comes to, like, the forgiveness of that, aren't you kind of hurting yourself if you don't forgive? I mean, the bitterness, I mean, I think like, you know, they won't talk to each other. They can't forgive it. It's like... But ultimately, who are they really hurting? You are but right. Them, but themselves, but their unwillingness to forgive. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. You're, said, you're, you're, uh, oh, yeah. Buddy Hackett said, yeah. that, uh, you know, if you don't forgive somebody of something, he said, you're the one sitting at home 
mad and said they're out damn. That's exactly that's Buddy Hackett. That was yeah. Buddy Hackett. That's exactly right. You're not doing any good. But you're 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 right in the terms of from, from a medical perspective, you're actually poisoning your own blood. You literally are, you are increasing, um, there are a number of substances that are toxic that actually accelerate the aging process that are elevated. When you're sitting there stewing, your interleukin-6 goes up, your tumor necrosis factor alpha, von Willebrand's factor, interleukins, the uh, ICAMs and VCAMs. These chemicals are accelerating your own death. You're actually causing disease in yourself. Okay, so it's really, you're, on multiple levels, you are harming yourself spiritually and physically.